Okay, thanks to Paul for his kind permission to let me edit this photograph and to video the process and let you see what I would do. I'm looking at it first of all and I notice that there's a lot of dark areas, but you get that with night photographs. The main thing is, what you need to do, especially at night, but it's true of any shot, is either choose to expose for the highlights or expose for the shadows. I would always expose for the highlights, like that which is what Paul's done. If you're shooting in RAW, it doesn't matter. As long as it's not completely black, it's recoverable. So we'll look at the RAW sliders now and bring some of that detail back. First of all, the shadows are going to have to go all the way up. I would move the blacks up a bit, maybe all the way, but we'll see in a moment. Clarity also gives you a bit more brightness, and it looks okay on stonework. Take it the other way, it's too soft for stonework, but it can be quite nice on, a, say, a bridal portrait, but not overdone. Let's have a look. I think maybe around there. And maybe we'll turn that black up a bit further. So, what else can we do here? We're going to need to bring the highlights down to try and even this lighten up a bit. Yeah, okay, I like that. I'm going to have a look at the contrast. Now, if we go too far, we've got that situation back where the darks are dark and the highlights are bright. But let's try and even those up somewhat. Let's maybe brighten that a touch. So it's fine. It looks fairly evenly lit now. And there's nothing Paul could have done about that because it's the lighting in the build, apart from turn the lights off and introduce his own. But sometimes it's easier just to do a good edit of it. I'm going to turn the vibrance up a little bit so we get some more colour back, but not too much. That's looking good. I'm going to check the colour temperature. I think it's fine. This is like white balance on your camera. See, that's too cold. That's too warm. Maybe just about there. Okay, let's load that into Photoshop now. Raw, shooting in raw, as most of you probably know, that's an editing process in its own right, and it really does set the scene for how your image is going to look. Now, okay, I'm looking at this now, and I see everything I would expect to see in a shot taken from a low level of a building, that the verticals converge. See that? Our brains tell us they're parallel, so unless you look closely, you might think they're parallel, but they're not. If they continued to converge like that, they'd meet somewhere off the top of the screen. And you see this with all kinds of architecture. The end of Durham Cathedral, which I often include in the night photography course, the end with the rose window, if you shoot that from down on the road, you're actually below the grass level, below the ground level. So you get a lot of convergence on that. And you can leave that because it shows a sense of perspective, but sometimes it's just too far. Sometimes correcting all of the verticals looks a bit flat and lifeless. But in this case, I want those to be parallel and I want everything to be level. So I want those parallel, and I also notice that although they're on the same plane, that is lower because the shot will have been taken slightly from the right. And also, old buildings may propose symmetry, they may suggest it, but they're far from symmetrical, simply because they didn't have the equipment we have these days for ensuring that kind of thing and planning for it. And also they shift over time. So, first of all, let's have a look at this. Let's create another layer to play with, Control j So we now have a background layer, which we can't do anything with, and a layer 1, which we can do whatever we want with. I'm going to switch the background layer off. Of course, you're not seeing anything different because they're both identical right now. But let's go in here. You can't use the Transform tool until you create a layer. It's a safety mechanism. But let's look at Edit, Transform, Distort. Now, I've turned the background layer off to make it really apparent what happens when you use tools like this, that you lose some of the image. I think that's kind of about level, but sometimes you have to have a go at these things. That's a bit higher there, and then you can go back in and do a, another Transform tool. Let's see how that's looking there. Uh, right. So we now need to go in there and fill some of these gaps in with scale, but also to make that the right dimensions because it's looking a bit squashed right now. So the stuff on the edges of this image that we can lose, like little bits of bricks and part features, which is not doing anything for it. 
So we can afford to pull that all the way out. We can pull that all the way out there. Um, I don't want to go too far with this. Let's try and make those level, make them even. So we've still got some work to do there. Notice it's looking quite squashed now. This is because we've corrected the convergent verticals, but there are other things showing from the way the photograph was taken, the way all photographs are taken. I'm going to nudge that up a little bit to try and get that arch looking about right. Um, they're kind of level, but let's push that up just a touch more. Not too far, though, because then that line is looking like it's sloping up. I think we'll, we're going to stick there. Right, okay, that's got rid of a lot of the problems. I can also go on to scale and pull that down. So it fills that gap up. So there's not much of a gap to fill there now. I can take that right up because it's all dead space anyway. Let's have the important bit. Now, okay, I'm looking at that and I'm going to need to look again, I think, at transform. You don't lose the detail. It's all there. I'm going to bring that in so we're not losing part of that arch, but I'm going to take that out to try and make them as symmetrical as possible. I'm going to take that out a touch because there's a lot there to fill in. Let's take it out about that. Okay. I think that is as good as we're going to get it, and that's looking fine to me. Now, I turn the background back on. It, it almost fills it in, so let's go with that. And do what you always do when you've been working with layers. You flatten them down, or you merge them down. I'm using Control Plus now to just zoom in and take a look at that corner. Now, for some people this may be good enough. Looking at a distance or in a small image, it is good enough. But there's that triangle there created by the transform and the movement of the layers. So I'm going to look now at what we can do there. So that was the spot healer, that one there. The spot healer is very good on Photoshop right now. It's getting every version of Photoshop, every update, is getting better and better with content aware tools where when you make a change like this you're not just making it blank it's putting detail in of what it thinks should be there based on what's surrounding it so that's okay we don't want to mess with that shadow there but notice we do have a couple of harsh lines there we have joins so we're going to have to play with that some more now this is going to take the clone stamp so the clone stamp will let you use Alt and then the left mouse click. Huh. Sometimes it does that for some reason. Let's just do one. Try again. Alt and click. I think it's just when you don't press everything in the right combination quick enough. Uh, sometimes you can use that as a brush and just draw. Sometimes it's it's good as a quick win just to try these things and see if you can get away with it. Clone that and drop it there. So I'm doing Alt click to pick something up and then just left click without any buttons to use it as a brush. So I'm drawing the shadow back in. That's looking good there now. Uh, so this needs a little bit of work. So that's cloned that out. There's an art to clone and there comes a point though where it just becomes second nature. And you can do things like quite easily clone out um, wires, telephone wires, electricity wires. But you must do it. Hmm, that one didn't work. With a small enough brush, otherwise it will be really obvious what you've done. So the only bit remaining is that. Again, who would notice it? Apart from I would, I would know it was there. So I'm just going to try and do it right. Let's maybe clone that along a bit so we get rid of that feature. That dark bit there. No, not crazy about that. Let's keep going. Yeah, like that? I do. That'll do for me. Now, if this were a pavement, you'd find it was covered in chewing gum, cigarette ends, all kinds of things. It's not, though. It's a well-cared-for historic building. But I'm still going to get that spot healer, make a nice small brush, and I'm going to remove that just to show you how easy it is to do content-aware removal of spots. 
Now I noticed before, let's zoom out here. That bit of brickwork there is distracting me. When you look at a composition like this, what it's doing is drawing the eye. Any archway, any doorway, any window, anything really that has lines and is pulling you in, you're going to be looking at what's in the middle. And that, to me, is a little bit distracting. There's nothing majorly wrong with it. Let's see if we can do a nice quick spot heel on it. Maybe even a clone stamp. Uh, we'll try the spot heel first, just so I can show you. Yeah, that gets rid of the black bit. Now if I put the clone stamp onto it, we should be able to clone that join there. I don't think there was a join there. I think it's just been an extremely long piece of stone. Like that one's pretty long as well. And it looks fine like that. It's just taken that distracting spot off it. Now, okay, finishing touches. I think I'm still happy with the way it's set up after we've done all of the transforms with it. I like the color. It's mostly yellow. Notice this with sandstone. You'll see this all over Durham and bits of Newcastle. Yellows and reds. There's a lot of reds in there. What I might do is go into there, image adjustments, hue saturation, and look at the red channel. And let's go to extremes with it, see? But notice how it's the red bricks that are changing the most. But then everything, there's red in all the sandstone. But if we take that to say, hmm, maybe about 30. It's not over the top, is it? Maybe slightly, let's take it to 20. You're seeing some differentiation now in the colour of stonework, which is there. It's present in the building. Let's look at the yellows just for the sake of illustration. Too far. Not enough. I might tone that down ever so slightly, but I'm going to have a look at this window selectively in a moment. Let's have a look at the other channels and see if there is anything. Is there any greens in there? Nope, no greens whatsoever. Are there any cyans in there, light blues? Nope, none of that. Any blues in there? Nope, no blues either. So interesting. Magenta, there'll be a little bit because it usually goes hand in hand with red. There we go. What is that? But let's set all them to zero and we'll okay that so we can store the settings for red and yellow. Interesting that some buildings, there's only two colours really going on. Now, as the eye is being drawn into the centre of this, I'd like to make a feature of that window. But I don't want to enhance all of the yellows because it'll be all over the shop. So here's what I'm going to do. You might not know you can do this, in which case it's worth you watching it just for this bit. If you get a lasso or a marquee and you go around and you mark something out, you can then selectively change the colour. So let's go into that saturation again. Let's look at the yellow. I'm going to deliberately turn it up too far. Now, let's zoom in and see what's happened. So, you can see the outline of the lasso, and it's it's okay, but it's not great, is it? But we can do better than that. Let's Control alt z go back, go back. Now, what we're going to do is right-click and feather it. So, feathering it gives it more diffuse edges. They're not sharp lines. So, even on something that small, feathering of 20 pixels will be fine. So let's do what I was doing before, into there, change the yellows, but only a bit, just enough to make a feature of the window. I like that kind of there. Maybe see if we can get away with it a little bit more yet. Yeah, okay. Now, um, Control D gets rid of any marquee. There we go. That was just the previous change flashing on there in the computer's memory. So feathering it and not being as extreme has made it really quite smooth. There we go. I like that. It's time for finishing touches now. So let's look at image. Let's look at brightness and contrast. So brightness so we can see everything. You don't want to leave stuff in shadows. Contrast. Mm, I'll leave it at that for now. And let's have a look at the vibrance again overall. Can we make it a bit more vibrant to give it a bit more colour? Yeah, 
I think we can. Now, okay, so the eye is naturally being drawn into the center, but the eye is being drawn a little bit to the outsides as well because it's of a similar level of brightness. It's a bit better lit inside, and that's partly to do with the light and on location and partly the way I've edited that. But let's look at putting a gradient on it. You could use a vignette tool, but vignettes, I don't like them. Uh, I think they're a bit too automatic and the computer makes too many decisions for you. There's some pretty crazy gradients in here that give you all kinds of colors. Um, it's interesting, we don't want that. So Control alt z gets us back. Most of the time you're going to be using that one, the last one, neutral density, and you're going to be using it with black. If we have it, say, another color like red, you'll get it. It's, it's hard to see, but there is a bit of a red vignette on there. I sometimes use a white vignette on light shots, like a shot of a bride or a shot of a white bird. Nope, I think it's overriding it. I'm just going to go where I was originally with black. Now, let's look at the opacity. That would make it more obvious. I'm going to put that on 100, and look what happens. You can pretty much obliterate a photograph in a few mouse strokes. Okay. I think I undid the vibrance, so let's go back there. Right. I am going to take that back down to where it was. I normally work between about 10 and 20, and then you can just do multiple strokes if it's not dark enough. We're on black. We're ready to go. So if I sweep it down there, this is with the left button pressed on the mouse. It's going to vignette it. If you move it a little bit less, the vignette is closer to the edges and doesn't darken the middle of the shot. So see that there? I'm just going around it, around it. I'm going to leave that fairly unvignetted because there should be light coming through there from inside. That was the bit with all the highlights on, so I'll do a bit of extra work on that. See, there's nothing wrong with the detail. Don't like that. That was too far. Undo that one. But it just draws the eye into where it should be in the center, especially with that light there, and especially now that I've enhanced that. So I like that, and I'm just going to take one final look at brightness and contrast. Hmm. It's a night shot, so you don't want it looking like it was taken in daylight. But I think, so you can see everything, I'm going to bump that up a touch. The contrast now is working much more as it should. Because that's dark, because I've made it dark and that's light, it's changing the important bits. So I'm going to put a fair bit of contrast on that. It's now looking to me maybe a little bit too saturated, so let's go and look at that. Turn the colour saturation down, but the vibrance up. Yeah, I think we've got a winner there. So I'm just going to leave it at that now. When you save off a file, save it as a JPEG. I often use quality 5 for upload to Facebook or 12 if it's going to be going in the archive or being printed. But I think we can safely say we're done with that. Thanks for watching.